thanks so much. Um, how are you all doing this morning? And, and how are you, Tom? I'm doing well, thanks. <laughs> I hate talks that open up with how are you doing? It's so awkward, but it's a ritual, right? That's a ritual. I've, I grew up in the 1970s. I grew up in the yeah 1970s, born in the 60s, grew up in the 70s, graduated from high school in the 80s. Southern California surf culture got swept up into the uh, surf Jesus movement of that time, which was super cool. I I lived inland, but I thought, man, I want to I want to be a surfer. I wanted to have long blonde hair, uh, but I was drawn to that that movement. I think for two reasons. One. I uh, just a, an intense feeling of belonging and connection. And there were people like me that were finding meaning in life and talking with each other about it. Second reason I was drawn to it was the 70s. No ritual, <laughs> or at least we thought, right? The, the 60s, 70s were a time, I don't really remember the 60s, but the 70s were a time of kind of shedding off ritual. I don't want to do the church thing. I don't want to do religious rituals. And of course, what we ended up doing in that movement was inventing all kinds of little rituals. I, I'm not an anthropologist, but I'm married to one. My wife, Hillary, who couldn't be here this morning, is a research professor at, at ASU, studies the cultural evolution of religion and human cooperation. We just had a paper published in a journal that we've always wanted to publish in after getting rejected from two other ones that we've always wanted to publish in. But uh, anthropologists like my wife uh, helped us during the 1900s to expand our definition of ritual a little bit, expanding it beyond uh, just the religious into all kinds of things in our everyday lives that function in similar ways and end up having some similar structure. So it works a lot better interpersonally when we run into each other on the street. How are you doing? Good. How are you doing? Good. Right? It's, it's almost meaningless. And it's almost as meaningless as some of the things we do. How many times have you said, how are you doing? Good. How are you doing? Good. And then you realize, oh, I should really ask her how she's doing. How are you doing? You're like, wait, I just asked that, but I guess I didn't mean it. I'm ritual. Uh, the kind of things we're trying to shrug off. And I think the reason that, so that we, we were trying to shrug this off is because what we wanted was the authenticity, the genuineness, and the real interpersonal human connection that comes when you're not doing something that's just rote. So if that's what we're all longing for, and rituals are the opposite of that. Why do they stick around? I mean, this is the kind of thing that somebody that studies the cultural evolution of humans asks is, okay, well, there must be, there must be a reason. Why do those things stick around? I, I think, I think the, the best reason that I've encountered for that is that it frees us up. No, when you're freed from something, you're freed from something and you're freed to something. So what are we freed up from? Can you imagine what it would be like? Just think of that greeting. How are you? Good. How are you? Good. If we had to invent a greeting every time we ran into somebody, how much cognitive load that is, how awkward it is, we'd all walk away going, well, that went poorly. <laughs> uh, but we don't, right? We've got this thing that kind of invites us into the flow. It invites us into the dance, right? We step into the dance with somebody. We've got that out of the way. And it frees us up from doing that. It frees us up for being fully present. And that's the bait and switch for today's talk. I'm not going to be talking mostly about ritual. I'm going to be talking mostly about what ritual can do for us, which is to free us up to be fully present. So what does it mean to be fully present? And why would you want that? If that sounds a little bit kind of pie in the sky, not relevant to my everyday life. I want you to consider this. Maybe this is my thesis for, for today. Um, ritual, sorry, not ritual, presence. Presence is the gateway to everything that you want in your life. Or maybe a better metaphor is it's, it's a key 
that opens up all of the different gates to everything that you want in your life. That's a huge claim. Um, what kind of things does, does being present buy for us in our lives? Let's just start with our, our work lives. Most of us are here because we're a part of the work community, uh, whether we're a part of a, a traditional team or whether we're solopreneurs, part of a, a small group. We all work in teams. Uh, we, all, we all work together. We all have a work life that we would like to go well. Most of us, uh, at least half of our waking hours are spent uh, in our work lives. So what does it buy for us uh, in terms of a better work life, this being present? Uh, and forgive me, I'm going uh, to rely on notes, uh, occupational hazard. I was a professor for a lot of years. This isn't a talk I give all the time, so I'm going to be glancing down at this a little bit. Uh, let me just run through a list of things that as I work at, at, for myself, I'll tell you a little bit about my story as we go through. Uh, but as I, as I work with myself and as I get to work with clients uh, and in consulting and coaching work that I do now, uh, these are some of the things that we work on to, to open up in their work lives. And almost always, whether it's the first day or whether it's a, a couple of months into the engagement, we're coming down to, oh, this is about learning how to be more fully present. So here are some things. Collaboration. Uh, Collaboration hasn't always been a part of our of our work environments. I, if you think back through the Industrial Revolution, the early 1900s, mid 1900s, late 1900s, now in a lot of our workplaces that are maybe sitting in that leadership model, it's more about dominance and um, it's really fear based rather than this kind of open let's connect, let's collaborate, let's make sure that I'm helping to meet your needs, you're meeting my needs, and together we're addressing the vision and the mission of the institution. If I, I am absolutely convinced of this. If you want to be a successful business, whether you're a solopreneur or a Fortune 500 company, if you want to be a successful business in as we move now into the second quarter, the 21st century, you will be collaborative. You will focus on, on humans. It's collaboration, uh, trust. Trust is really the foundation that builds collaboration. You don't just go manufacture trust. Trust is built on a foundation of being present uh, with yourself, being present with other people. Uh, I like the phrase high-performing teams. Uh, it reminds us that being present, which I think is absolutely the key to being a high-performing team, to the collaborativity that give, makes you a high-performing team. Uh, being present in that way isn't just about feeling good. Yeah, it's a lot about that. What a wonderful thing to be able to enjoy our work lives and to have the people that report to us, that we report to, our colleagues, have them enjoy their lives because we're a little bit more connected. That's great, but this is also the secret sauce to being a high-performing team. You're more productive, you're more effective, uh, you're more efficient, uh, you're more sustainable, you're not turning over employees or uh, clients on a regular basis. A uh, Couple of other things, less emotional reactivity. Being present kind of settles our nervous systems down. I'll talk a little bit about, about that. Uh, but it puts us into a space, uh, especially if we do this intentionally, uh, it puts us into a space where we're less emotionally reactive. The number of careers that are terminated or, or severely limited by emotional reactivity is, is absurd. I worked for a college president uh, really closely. We worked together for about 20 years. Uh, he came from uh, Harvard uh, MBA background, uh, but he said emotional reactivity, that's the one thing. It was look around you and, and the number of people that are going to end their careers by not being able to be aware of what they're feeling before it turns into something bad is amazing. Uh, more positivity, less negativity. That's been a big one in my life. I realized a few years ago, man, I'm just carrying around this Eeyore's cloud of negativity, and I don't have to do that. 
wasn't just a switch flip to uh, to change. I still work with that, but um, more positivity. Natural and productive communication, effective navigation of conflict. We're all in conflict. How you navigate it is what matters. And learning how to be present with your own feelings and with people around you, uh, I think is one of the things that really helps us to navigate conflict well. Active listening, uh, and maybe one that's really uh, relevant to this group. I uh, love the ritual of reading the manifesto each time. Uh, we were reminded this is about creativity and innovation. Right? When you are fully present, it changes your nervous system. We'll talk about maybe a few ways of, of doing that. But you change the way that your peripheral nervous system works. You change the way that your central nervous system works. And one of the things that you do is you engage several of the dopamine systems. Dopamine is involved in lots of stuff, feeling good, learning. It's also involved in just kind of loosening things up. You've got neural networks that start to come alive, possibilities that you see that you cannot see when you're in this background fight or flight mode. Uh, better work lives. What else? Better social lives. Just go through that whole list and ask, wow, if that was true of me and my, my environment generally, that'd be great at work. What would that be like with my, my large network of friends? Close personal relationships. What would, be like, what would that be like with my partner, my very closest friends, with my kids? Uh, and maybe most foundational is ourselves, our relationship to, to ourselves, being present with yourself. Easy to say, hard to do. But again, you can go through that checklist and just ask, what if, it was, what, what if I was like that with me, with myself? What would that be like? As I said, most of us walk around in this background of kind of a mild fight, flight, freeze response. That's one of the ways that our peripheral nervous system, our autonomic nervous system is designed to, to act. Evolution gave us this gift because sometimes you're at the watering hole and there are crocodiles and you should be thinking, I, I don't want to be learning now. I don't want to be connecting. I, want, I need to get a drink and I don't want to get eaten. That's really useful in those situations. Uh, I love adventure sports, uh, ocean kayaking, surf kayaking. I uh, used to do a lot of ice climbing and mountaineering, rock climbing. And in those things, yeah, sometimes you find yourself in a place where it's good to be in a fight or flight mode. But when you're in the boardroom and you're looking around and you're wondering how many of these people are crocodiles. You know, you're not thinking that out loud, but uh, that's, that's what this background mood, uh, this background way of being in your nervous system is preparing you for. Uh, rough on your health, rough on your relationships, obviously, rough on your creativity, rough on work. Uh, turns out, uh, we didn't really understand this when the autonomic nervous system was first kind of unpacked for us about uh, almost exactly 100 years ago now. Uh, we talked about two branches. Yeah, there's the fight, flight, freeze response. There's a bunch of stuff we know about that. And then there's this other thing, the parasympathetic. Uh, we don't really know what that does. I don't know. I guess it's, it's good for calming us down. Well, it turns out the last 20 years or so, we've learned a lot about that. And that other side, that other way of being in our bodies is also a design feature, if you want to think of it that way, about our, uh, our, our, ourselves. It is about social connection. It's about being present. It's about softening. Do you know that when that parasympathetic nervous system is activated, uh, we might call it the, uh, I, I didn't make this up, the uh, tend and befriend as opposed to the fight or flight, or fight, flight, freeze. I, and I love that name because it reminds us that this isn't just about calming us down. It's about opening us up and helping us to connect. That changes the way your visual system works. It changes actually the way your ears work so that you can hear warmth and kindness 
and somebody else's voice. You can see facial features changing that signal, I'd like to connect with you. When we're in fight or flight mode, we get that shut off, right? You don't wanna be looking at somebody who's a potential predator and accidentally get sucked into a connection with that thing, that person. But when we're safe, this is what allows us to be really human, to do the great things that we do as humans, which is to work together. Uh, my, uh, my research, uh, I, I left the 1970s, the 1980s. I, I went off to college. Somebody tricked me into going to college. I thought I was gonna, uh, thought I was gonna lifeguard and ski patrol. Uh, that was my career plan for the rest of my life, right? I was in my you know, teens, 20s. Uh, somebody tricked me into going to college. I took an anatomy class and I thought, wow, this is great. I met that guy later and he's like, oh yeah, I, I, you didn't need the anatomy class. I just knew you'd like that professor. And so 11 years later, I get out with my undergraduate degree, my PhD, a year of postdoc, uh, studying what it means to be a person, psychology and neuroscience. And I was really in, in, interested in this. What is encased in this skin that makes me me, that makes you you and the really basic stuff like how do visual processes work? I'm I'm colorblind. I'm a dichromat. I not completely colorblind, but I'm colorblind. You see in three dimensions. I see in two. That fascinated me. Uh, reaching and grasping. I did my entire dissertation on how we do this. And drink. I, I, I was in uh, Indiana for my postdoc and I met somebody who said uh, outside of academia, he said, wow, I'd really like to read your dissertation. I said, no, man, you really don't. And he said, no, I really would. And I, I caught for some reason I had a paper copy of it. And I'm like, well, you know, here. About two months later, I got it back. He wrote on the front <laughs> in red. Some people might find this interesting, but I am not one of them. And he gave it back to me. <laughs> I thought, oh, great, thanks. <laughs> Uh, so it's, uh, I found it interesting, uh, but where it really opened up and, you know, emotions and learning, that was a big part of what I, I did. So I got to unpack all this stuff about what's in here, where it really opened up for me, though, was as I started my first job at the University of uh, Puget Sound up in the Northwest, I was there for uh, four years, I think, five years, and then I had an opportunity to move back to Santa Barbara, where I'd done my PhD. Uh, it's always nice to go back to Santa Barbara. I uh, went to a small, a Christian liberal arts college there, Westmont College. I was there for, I don't know, 18 years or so, loved it. Um, and I, I, I got to do research in whatever I want. I, I, I didn't have to be bringing in these, you know, multi-million dollar grants. I, and what I found myself really gravitating to was the interpersonal. Uh, let me tell you about a couple of the areas. I'm just going to just quickly, this isn't a big part of the talk, but I want you to know a little bit about my life and what gets me going. Uh, mirror neurons. So we were studying, like I said, reaching and grasping. We were part of a, a network of labs around the world, five or six labs. I didn't get to go to these great international conferences. My advisor did. And she got back from, um, uh, from Parma, Italy, once she said, I just heard the most fascinating things. Those neurons that we study, left hemisphere of the brain, there's some neurons that you know, grind away when I want to pick up something to drink. They allow me to orient my arm, close my hands, pick that up and take a drink. Uh, she said, there's a lab there that we're listening to those neurons, right? They go tick, 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 tick when they get excited and then quiet when they're not tick, 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 and monkeys. And she said, guess what? They notice that they fire when someone else reaches out, pick it up. And I thought, tell them to get back to work. <laughs> That's not what we're studying here. I want to know how it coordinates. But over the next year or two or three, I realized, oh my gosh, that is the neural basis of empathy, of how we connect. I see you doing something that activates the part in me that does that same thing. Sometimes, right? You, I nod, you start to nod, you smile, I smile, right? We're mirroring each other. This is why they're called mirror neurons. Um, that completely revolutionized my life. I'm like, that's what we're doing. So we put uh, EEG caps on people and watch that, try to figure out 
what's going on under what conditions? How does that show up as genuine collaboration? I, the peripheral nervous system that I talked about, I got super interested in that parasympathetic side. As soon as I realized it's not just rest and digest, it's tend and befriend, that's big. Uh, and I wasn't the only one. There were uh, hundreds of people around the world who were kind of having the same epiphany. Oh, it's about how we connect. It's not just about what's going on inside the darkness of our skulls. And uh, meditation, it's kind of a, a, a strange one for me. I'd, I'd always practiced some form of prayer or meditation in my life. I'm usually bouncing around between traditions. I like to do that. I, uh, again, came from the 70s in Southern California. I'm, I got to meet somebody who was uh, an amazing executive coach. He was my president's executive coach. He also happened to be Bill Gates' executive coach. So the guy came with credentials. And I, my president introduced me to him. We started talking. We realized we had all these common interests. And he said, have you ever studied meditation in the lab? And I said, no, but I have a feeling we're going to. And we spent several years putting EEG caps on people, doing brain imaging and looking to see what's going on and how does that actually then behaviorally play out in their lives. And I, I got a little bit more curious, I, I, mainly as an academic, but I, you know, it all, also upped my practice a little bit on that. I, I ran into different traditions. We'd work with Vedanta nuns or, uh, practicing Zen Buddhists or, or Theravadan Buddhists. Um, and that also kind of started to reconnect me back to some rituals, because often these things are, are involved in rituals. And as I thought about our, our interactions, I realized, oh, uh, rituals actually have this other function. Just before I met Hillary, I, I didn't know uh, anything about the anthropology of this and that other people were thinking about it as well. Um, what I did know about was practices and habits and how important doing things was to being in a particular way. Um, I haven't really said anything uh, about what I mean by, by being fully present. I, I want to come back to rituals in a in a few minutes, I, but I want to I want to camp for a few minutes on just what it means to be fully present, and I'm not going to give you a definition of it. You probably know what I mean when I say be fully present. You might have as difficult time articulating that as I do, and even if I could come up with a, a theory, a, a conceptual definition, that probably wouldn't convey very much. I think the only way to really experientially understand what being present, or I love the phrase being fully present, doesn't mean being perfectly present. It means being present in all of your fullness, bringing all of you to it, being present with somebody else and all of their fullness, and allowing some openness there. But I think the only way of really conveying what that means is just to, just to get you be present, <laughs> just go do it, and then pause and see what it feels like. So let's do that just for a second. We'll do this a little bit more later as well, but um, why don't you just right now be present? Just do it. Maybe take a breath. Did you know that the act of bringing awareness to your breath takes what was fully automatic and it brings it partly under your control. And if you can just watch and be aware and let it do what it's doing, be curious, be fascinated with that, that automatically drops you into place of being present. That is something that activates this parasympathetic nervous system. I don't really like the word hack, but that's a hack. <laughs> um, you're not feeling present, Take that breath, bring your awareness to the breath. So do that, just take a couple of breaths. Breathing in, what does it feel like? And breathing out, what does it feel like? And if you found yourself getting distracted 17 times during the in-breath, more during the out-breath, just do it again and see if maybe it drops to 
10 times. And just let go. I don't know, let go of what? Just let go of whatever you're holding on to. Just release a little bit. Be present. Present with your breath. As I said, I'm not going to give you a conceptual definition of what being present is, because I don't know. I, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you uh, four, I don't know, tips, strategies for doing this thing we call being present. And maybe as we're continuing the talk, continue to be present. Maybe try some of these just as we're talking about them. And, and as you do that, take that presence that's with your breath. Let it expand out to the rest of your body. Maybe notice the tingling in your fingers. The chair feels like against your back. And then let it expand out beyond that and realize that, oh, I'm in this connected, safe place. There are no alligators in here. Uh, this is a place where we can really be present with each other. So here are four things. One, do presence. Talk about being presence, present, which I really like because it's a way of being. It's not just a checklist of things that you do. If you approach being present like that, you're not going to be present. But being is really importantly tied to doing. As you do things like take a breath, a little artificial, yeah. As you do things like, hey, how are you doing today? Good. How are you doing today? Good. You step into that flow. If you're open to that, you step into that flow, you cross a threshold and it frees you up to be a little bit more present. So do things. Do presence. Helps you to be present. The more you drop into being present, the more it helps you to do things that you weren't even aware of that help you to be, that help you to do. It's a great positive feedback cycle. Uh, we could spend the rest of our time here coming up with a list. Uh, we're not going to do that. Google it. Uh, <laughs> make your own list. These are things that I could do to be present. Or you know, better, ch ch chat with somebody afterwards. What do you do to be present? What do you find yourself doing that makes you more present? I'll give you one example, though. Uh, Melissa Farley, a uh, good friend of mine, uh, also a business partner on a couple of ventures that I'll probably mention at some point during my talk. Uh, must have been about a year and a half ago, we were getting together for coffee. Uh, and I was a little bit late. She was a little bit early. Uh, she'd, already, uh, she'd already showed up. And as I walked in, I could see her. She's over there busy on her phone, you know, grrr, I don't know, doing social media magic for a client and posting, post, post. And, grrr, and she, you know, just obviously very intensely involved. And I walked in and I said, <laughs> Hey, Mel, how you doing? All right. And rather than just kind of, yeah, uh, good, Tom, how are you? Uh, she, she took her phone mid post probably. And she very graciously, but very um, intentionally turned the phone upside down. She never broke eye contact with me. She turned it upside down and she pushed it so far away. I was afraid somebody was going to steal it. Never breaking eye contact. She brought her hands back and said, yeah, how are you doing? And I, I, I walked away from that meeting just thinking that was genius. And it's genius because not only is it doing something to be present, right? It's removing a distraction. It's also doing something that signals presence. And that's important. That's an invitation for me then to drop into being present. So what do you do? What's that thing? And I don't want to demonize phones. I... I try to do that as much as I can now, Ooh, put it away, slide it away. But when I'm done with that meeting, I pick it up and open up the text to my uh, my wife, Hillary, and I send a little heart emoji. Uh, that's our little ritual. It's just something that says, hey, I'm, I'm far away right now, but I'm being present with you. I've, it's turned out to be a great way of staying connected. This is an amazing way to connect to people. So it's not the technology. That's the problem here. It's the way that we use it, of course. Um, do presence. Second, um, feel presence. In the Western world, we don't really prioritize emotions very much. I think we've, we've, we've made some really good strides in the last 50 years 
or so. But as, as we look at just Western culture and, and our culturally what we think of as really important to being us, it's, a, it's about cognition or maybe sensation, action, but emotions are just like, yeah, it's the extra thing that comes on. Eh, it's great to feel good when you can. Uh, emotions turn out to be really Im importantly integrated. Emotion, it's the thing that moves us into motion, that moves us into action. Uh, one reason to just pause and feel presence is that it feels good. And if part of what we're trying to do is to create a world in which there's less suffering, when we're at work, less corporate and institutional suffering, if that's a world we're trying to create, well, start here. You, you feel good. You make a connection that feels good. You're pre you feel yourself being present. Pause. Enjoy that. Uh, but two other reasons that I think this is uh, super important. Uh, when we are pausing to feel what it feels like to be present, again, we're changing that nervous system, opening up that, those same dopaminergic pathways that are that are functioning in uh, creativity and innovation. But we are, um, we're creating space to be able to notice what it was we were just doing. I said, having a checklist isn't a great idea. It's not a bad idea, it gets you started. But that checklist is going to be very artificial. What's more important is how you do it, the nuanced little ways, things that you will never even be able to name and write down in a checklist. And that's what feeling present does for you. You pause, you feel, you that gives you the space to open up and say, well, what was it that I was doing that created this little space? So consciously being aware of what you were doing, the connection between point one and two, doing and feeling. Uh, the other thing that it does for us, again, changing that nervous system, it literally opens us up into a mood that is conducive to learning, to, uh, to rewiring the brain. Our brains are not hardwired. It's a terrible language that we picked up along the way. Our brains are wired. What, what they are wired to do is to rewire themselves. That's one of the most fundamental things about the, the primate brain, the human brain in particular. We are wired to constantly rewire ourselves. But when we're in fight or flight, the brain is not set up to do that well. It's when we're in that other mode, that dopamine is flowing, we're actually able to start changing synaptic connections, increasing some, pruning out others. When you pause to feel being present, you're opening up your body to be able to change itself so that you do that more. Or equally, when you find yourself breaking presence, ooh, things were going so well in that conversation and all of a sudden he's just cold. Don't, uh, don't run away from that. That's our natural inclination. I think it's mine, avoid and escape anything that feels uncomfortable, especially when I'm the awkward one. I, instead, pause. Feel what it feels like to break connection. Here's a mind mess for you. Be present with the fact that you're not present. Okay, but by doing that, you've become present. And by doing that, you've opened up, you've begun to open up this, this channel in your brain for understanding, well, what was it that I was doing that was breaking that? Third thing, so do it, feel it. Third thing, and bear with me on this one, this one's a little bit different, have presence. We all know what it's like to be in a room with somebody who has presence, right? She walks into the room and everyone's attentional spotlight goes, ooh, I, go, I wonder what she's going to say. I wonder what he's, oh, even if he's not answering the question, I wonder what he thinks about that. There are people who just have presence. Um, one of my uh, favorite authors is uh, Mihai Csikszentmihalyi. It took me forever to learn how to pronounce his name. I understand he just went by Mike C at the Claremont Graduate Schools where he taught. Makes sense. Uh, but Csikszentmihalyi, uh, well, you might not recognize the name, but you will recognize the concept. He's the one that gave us the concept of flow, the way that that lives in our, our lexicon now. And what he identified uh, as kind of the beginning of positive psychology there in Southern California, Claremont at the time, was uh, in artists, where he started, 
creatives more generally, performers in particular, and elite athletes. So the best of the best, there would be moments in their lives where they were able to enter into this, this place of complete immersion and, and flow. Right? They, were, they were connected with what they were doing on a lost sense of time. I, I like to think about being present as flow for the rest of our lives. And it's not reserved for a few people. It's not reserved for um, just a few moments of peak experience. It's great when we get those because you really have a, a, a chance to feel what it's like. Um, it's available to us every moment of our lives. At any moment, we can choose to be present. And people who people who practice doing presence, feeling presence, uh, and thinking about what it means to, uh, to have presence, they end up cultivating this sense of presence. Uh, now, of course, you can, as a, as a leader, you know, you could cultivate pre a presence of fear, domination. That's one leadership strategy. Uh, I don't think that's one that's going to survive well and thrive in the, the 21st century. I'm talking about the kind of presence where you, you turn towards somebody and say, I want to be like that. That's that's cool. I whatever that person says, I would like to follow it. So having presence. Now you might think of that uh, as something that you're either born with. That's not true, or somebody that uh, something that you you've done these other things and it cultivates that, and this is just the byproduct. That's not true either. People who have presence have cultivated that intentionally, and one way to do that is to when you find yourself showing up, that's what we mean by having presence, right? It's how you show up. When you find yourself showing up in the way that you want to show up, confidence, maybe compassion, um, as a leader, don't run away from that. It's so easy to do. Most of us, um, you know, if I ask for a show of hands on uh, imposter syndrome, everybody's hand would go up. I'm not going to do it. Um, most of us, we catch ourselves doing something well, and we're like, oh, yeah, well, that's, I don't know, that's not really me. Who knows where that came from? And we've got all kinds of ways of dismissing it and walking away, because that actually feels a little uncomfortable to be in this presence space. But if you can pause and lean into it, find yourself having that little bit of confidence, that little bit of presence, and just lean into it ever so, so slightly. Fourth thing. So do presence, feel presence, have presence. The fourth thing I think is the secret sauce that kind of glues all of that together. Wrap all of that in a mood, an attitude of compassion, kindness, care, curiosity, openness. The, the particular words aren't what's important here. You know what I'm talking about. It's a way of oriented to orienting towards others. It's a way of orienting towards yourself. Bring that mood. And all of a sudden, the doing, the feeling, and the having are going to start to blossom. They're going to start to open up. I'll tell you when this... Um, are, are we doing okay on time early? Great. Um, I think when this really started to open up for me was fly fishing. I, I had fished as a kid, I hunted a little bit as a kid, never I, I put that away, didn't end up doing it. The sports that appealed to me were these more kind of uh, adventure sports. But uh, it's been about five years ago now, my wife's uh, brothers, my brother-in-law lives up in Seattle. We were up there in a beautiful, crisp October, uh, just vacationing a little bit out on the peninsula and Colin asked, Hey, you want to go fly fishing? He's really into it. I thought, yeah, I don't fish, but if you want to take a newbie, I'm, I'm happy to do it. So I borrowed some waders, borrowed some boots. Like, I don't even, I don't even know how to put this stuff on. This is not my sport. Uh, he gave me a, a pole, a reel. I'm like, I, I don't know. This is weird, heavy line, brightly colored. And then this, you know, invisible 10 feet of, of tippet line. And then a you know, a little tiny, tiny hook with some bright feathers on the end that doesn't weigh anything. I'm like, I don't even know how I'm going to get this out into the water. And best instruction on anything I've ever had. 
he's a man of few words. We walked out into the water, uh, Puget Sound, up to our waist, and he said, here's how to do a roll cast. So try it. No, no. No. Like, okay, it flopped out. He's like, great. Keep doing that till it looks like this. And he does this beautiful roll cast. Keep doing that. And then when you think you got that master, just look down the beach. I'll be fishing down there and try to copy what I'm doing. All right, great. Okay. Um, so, you know, I'm tangled in line, but I get some roll casts and pretty soon I'm watching him and I'm like, oh, and this line unfolded behind me. I, this, you get this loop and it just unfolds. And when it's back there, you bring the pole forward where that line goes out first and it just kind of unrolls and then it gets to the invisible part and then the fly goes just like a real fly landing in the water. And I was like, Oh, you know, there's a little storm coming in, the sun, Mount Rainier in the background. I'm like, I get it. I get the allure and the mystique of fly fishing. But here's what really opened up for me. So, okay, first of all, I was fully present in that moment. But what really opened up for me was later, I was Googling, trying to figure out how to get better at this. I, oh, my gosh, the language that fly anglers use here, it's not what the fly looks like. You don't have to match the hatch. You don't have to look exactly like that fly. What's important is how the fly, anybody knows the word? How it presents. How the fly presents. I'm like, oh my gosh, it's the language of presence and presentation. It, it, when, you, when you fish, this is all catch and release fishing. I'm, you're, you're, you're playing a game with the fish. And if you want the fish to play the game with you, you got to show up on its terms. And it's great, right? You bring that fish in. I finally got one that day. Bring the fish in. You take this little barbless hook out of the cartilage on the side of their mouth. You hold them down into the water. And right, sometimes they just hang out. Like I've had them swim around my feet for 30 seconds before swimming off. Sometimes they're out there like lightning. And sometimes it's oh, just this casual swim away. But it's this feeling of, of connection. If you want to play that game, you have to show up in a way that's appropriate to that fish. If we want to play the game, whether that's in the boardroom, with your clients, with other folks, collaborators that you're working with, we have to show up in a particular way too. And with humans, that presentation, that showing up is being present, being connected. I, the uh, project that Mel and I collaborate on is actually, uh, I started, I pitched to her one day. I said, what if we led retreats? Uh, we do fly fishing, uh, meditation, which is a lot of what I do end up doing with uh, some of my clients and students. Fly fishing, meditation, and best business practices. She's like, let's go do that. So we've run a couple of them. If you're ever interested, look me up. I've got cards here. Uh, but uh, that, I, that has become uh, one of my favorite things that I do because it's so easy to get people out there, to get them to be present and say, what would it be like if you showed up that way with all of your direct reports? Oh. Uh, all right, I want to wrap us up here so we've got a little bit of time. Um, back to rituals very quickly. My, my research turns, I left my teaching post. I came out here to ASU, followed my now wife, Hillary, out here. She was research professor at ASU. I took a job and I thought maybe, oh, maybe I'll do coaching and consulting. I really like this guy I worked with in med meditation. Uh, but I ended up taking a job with ASU uh, on the corporate and institutional side. Yeah, wow, what a pressure cooker. Completely different than the leadership world that I had been in you know, as a faculty member. And I flailed. <laughs> I, I found myself being emotionally reactive. I was pushing back. I wasn't being a good manager. And I thought, I'm going to turn this into my own personal laboratory, and I'm going to figure this out. Now, it didn't, wasn't all roses, right? I'm not the president of ASU now. As uh, a matter of fact, about three years ago, I just said, baton, hand off, done. Um, I got to go do something else. Uh, but during that time, I, I really did learn a lot about what it means, not just academically to be present, but kind of the practical side, the pragmatic side opened up for me. One of the things that I started to do was meditation. Uh, 
And there were little rituals that I started to notice, like the way that I breathe, uh, like the way that I sit. I, I refused to sit cross-legged for a couple of years. I'm just like, I don't do that stuff, man. <laughs> uh, and then finally, I tried it one time as I read, like, everybody's talking about this. I'm like, oh my gosh, that really changes the way I'm feeling. And that's now become a little part of the ritual. Of course, it, I, I got involved at the uh, Tempe Zen Center, uh, where I now lead meditations on a lot of the mornings in the week. And I saw all kinds of rituals. Ding, 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 clap, clap, clap. Like, what? And I got the incense and bowing. I, I got bowing. I like, watch. Did I be bowing? Is it a half bow? Is it a full bow? Uh, but what the director there explained to me, he said, you know, don't get caught up in this. Just uh, don't take any notes. Quit, put that, put your phone down. Just do it. Uh, and what you find is as you settle into it, it frees you up. Pretty soon you don't have to worry about all of this. You're just freed up to be completely present here. And that's the best definition of meditation I've ever heard. Intentional practice of being present. We set aside a little time, five minutes, 10 minutes, an hour, whatever you have. You set aside daily time and you just say, I'm going to be present with whatever is right here right now. And that is a lot easier to say than it is to do because all this crap starts coming up, your emotions and what you did yesterday and what you got to do this afternoon. What I would love for us to uh, to do as we, we wrap up here, just a, another minute or so, let me invite you into one of my daily rituals. Uh, this is uh, breathing meditation practice. I start every day like this almost and I come back to it at least one or two times during the day, even if it's only for a few seconds. Uh, so get yourself comfortable. You don't have to find any particular posture. Maybe close your eyes. If not, just drop your gaze uh, someplace that's, that's comfortable and just go back to that breath. Just take a breath and be present with it. Whatever that means for you, feel it. Pay attention how it enters your nostrils. Is it a little bit hard to breathe? Is it easy? Doesn't matter, just bring your awareness to it. Breathing in, aware of breathing in, what's that like? And breathing out, aware of breathing out. Breathing in, aware of the entire flow of the in-breath and breathing out aware of the entire flow of the out-breath. Are there distractions and noises and things? Yeah, of course, it's life. Just set it aside, come back to your breath. Breathing in, aware of your whole body's involvement and breathing in, your fingers tingling a little differently on the in-breath than on the out-breath. Breathing in, now just letting go. And breathing out as your shoulders drop, long out-breath, just letting go of whatever you were holding on to, that tension in your jaw, creases in your forehead, to-do list for this afternoon. Just let it go. Feel what it's like to be present. Feel what it's like to kind of have presence in that way. And appreciate right now the mood of compassion, kindness, care, curiosity, and openness that you're bringing. Open your eyes or bring your eyes up. Look around and now expand that being present to everyone around you and enjoy your morning. I'm going to turn it back over to Laura Lee.